Good morning and uh, welcome to everybody. Um, it's wonderful to see you here, whether you're here in person or on live stream, it's great to have you all with us. Now you may have been up late watching another kingly event, but now we're here with millions of other Christians around the world worshipping the King of Kings, the one who rules over all things, including human coronations. My name is James, I'm the service leader this morning, and a bit later Cam will continue in our, uh, in our series in Mark's Gospel. Um, we're up to chapter 2, so we look forward to that. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Yes, it's a, it's a wonderful thing that the Lord does promise to indeed be with us. And um, please pray with me now. Heavenly Father, we thank you as our mighty creator, the one who made all things for your purposes. And we cannot thank you enough that you are also our merciful redeemer. So help us today to respond in the right way, to worship you in spirit and in truth, so that our worship is indeed heartfelt and Christ-centered, and in his name we pray. Amen. We're going to stand and sing our first two songs, which pick up the, the whole theme of singing to the Lord joyfully and praising him for how great he is. Please stand. And we'll together sing, All people that on earth do dwell.
Yes, indeed, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. That includes us. Yes, please be seated. Welcome if you've just come in. Um, my name is James. I'm the service leader. And Cam, our senior minister, is going to bring us a bit of news. Thanks, Cam. Good morning, everyone. Yes, welcome uh, to all our regulars. And welcome if you're visiting with us this morning. It's lovely to have you here. Okay, I have uh, three um, items, actually four items of news. So the first one is new church directory, last chance. Last chance to uh, check your details, amend them if necessary, and uh, please do initial it, uh, saying that you're fine with going in the, in the directory. And please, if you uh, haven't already and you need to get an updated photo, uh, please do get that. So um, uh, Alex Koshi, Mr. Photo Man, can you do that again this morning, please? Yep, excellent. Thumbs up. So you can have a photo just... Uh, out in the foyer there, which is where the draft copies of the directory are. So please make sure um, you've checked that. Uh, thank you. Next slide, please. And so here is an opportunity, if you're female, to invite other people uh, to come and hear about Jesus. And so you can see all the details there. I won't read them for you. Could be um, particularly people who are um, into maybe uh, fashion. Remember, this is an over 100-year-old uh, baptismal gown or people who are into sort of history or family history or just want to hear human interest stories. They're the sort of people you might be thinking of. They might be particularly likely to say yes when you invite them to come along. And so do be praying, do be thinking, who could you invite to go with you and hear about Jesus? So see Gail today uh, for ticket or tickets uh, for that. Okay, uh, Rachel coming the end of this month, not very far away now, just uh, three Sundays away, so we want to have a, a program lined up for her, and so there's a sheet out in the foyer, thank you to the people who put their name down that you or your group would like to have Rachel come and uh, talk to you about what she will be going uh, back to Eurasia to do, and so there's plenty of room still though, so please uh, uh, put your name down there, it could just be you have a 30 minute coffee with her. What have you been doing the last year, Rachel? What are you going to be doing in the next year? It could be as simple um, as that. What can I pray for you? Or uh, she comes along to your group, something like that. So put your name down on the list in the foyer and um, we'll help her to have a more encouraging and useful and helpful time here. Okay, sound and live stream operators are wanted. Uh, I think at about a 10 to 9, Alex Koshi was at the back there with his arms spread out like this. 
across all three sort of keyboards type thing. I'm not sure his arms were long enough. <laughs> and I don't know enough about operating that, even though I've got the long arms, that wouldn't help. And so it would be great if we could have more people uh, who were trained to, uh, to do the sound or the live stream or the pro presenter um, as well. So it's just about learning it. I learnt a bit about the sound. I learnt about how to do some of the, uh, the, the pro presenter. If I can learn, I'm sure you can too. And so uh, please do see Alex or Robin up there at the back or see me or uh, tell one of the other leaders that you might be able to learn and uh, help your church by doing that. Okay, that's it for me. So back to James. Thank you. It's time now for those who, the kids who are not already over in, in the hall um, to go off to Tiny Tots, that's preschool, uh, children's church and youth forum. Tiny Tots are in the hall building over there um, and the others are in the church hall. Um, if you um, are visiting, if you'd like your kids to go out, I'm sure they'll have a great time. If you'd like to go out and settle them to start with, you're very welcome. Uh, I'll pray for them all now. Heavenly Father, we thank you that, that you love and care for us and our mission is to, is to bring all people of all ages to come to know our Lord Jesus. So please watch over our young people today in their different groups. In Jesus' name we pray. So if you'd like to go to the um, Tiny Tots, follow Stuart, who's taking Arthur, even though he's a little bit underaged <laughs> for that. Um, the creche room is open if you'd prefer that and otherwise the children's church. So the visitors, if you'd like to go out, you are very welcome. <laughs> and um, there's also care and communication cards that are around here. If you'd, if you'd like to, if you'd like to fill one of those out, if you let us know what if you have any particular needs, if you'd like to join a home group, any feedback for the services, you're, you're very welcome um, to do those. After each service, we have a prayer ministry uh, today. Uh, Sue and I will be down the front to pray with anybody who would like prayer for themselves or for somebody they wish to pray for. Our key verse from Mark chapter 2 today why does he, that is Jesus, eat with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Gal is going to bring us our two Bible readings. I'd encourage you to follow along either in your Bibles or on the screen. Thanks very much. The first Bible reading is from Isaiah, chapter 62, verses 1 to 5, and that's on page 1160 in the Church Bibles. Isaiah 62, 1 to 5. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet, till her vindication shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your vindication and all kings your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will, be, will bestow. You will be a crown of splendour in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. No longer will they call you des deserted or name your land desolate, but you will be called Hepzibah and your land Beulah, for the Lord will take delight in you and your land will be married. As a young man marries a young woman, so will your builder marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. And the New Testament reading is in Mark chapter 2, starting at verse 1 and going through to chapter 3, verse 6, and that's on page 1557 in the Church Bibles. That's Mark chapter 2. A few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door, and he preached the word to them. Some men came, 
bringing to him a paralysed man carried by four of them. Since they could not get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and then lowered the mat the man was lying on. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralysed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, Why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, Why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralysed man? Your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, We have never seen anything like this. Once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. A large crowd came to him and he began to teach teach them. As he walked along, he saw Levi, son of Alphaeus, sitting at the tax collector's booth. Follow me, Jesus told him. And Levi got up and followed him. While Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, Many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law, who were Pharisees, saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said to them, it is not the healthy who needs a doctor, but the sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them, and on that day they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment. Otherwise, the new piece will pull away from the old, making the tear worse. And no one pours new wine into old wine skins. Otherwise, the wine will burst the skins, and both the wine and the wine skins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wine skins. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields. And as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisee said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Another time, Jesus went into the synagogue and a man with a shriveled hand was there. Some of them were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus, so they watched him closely to see if he would heal him on the Sabbath. Jesus said to the man with a shriveled hand, Stand up in front of everyone. Then Jesus asked them, which is lawful on the Sabbath, to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they remained silent. He looked around at them in anger and, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts, said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was completely restored. Then the Pharisees went out and began to plot with the Herodians how they might kill Jesus. Hear the word of the Lord.
Okay, so please do keep a Bible open there at uh, Mark's Gospel. If you have it at the start of chapter 2, uh, that will help you. And also if you have the uh, sermon outline where you can see it, that will help you as we uh, go through this chapter as well. But let me pray for us first. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, are your son so often said and did things which were surprising. Heavenly Father, so often your son said and did things which were very controversial. But Heavenly Father, he didn't do them just for the sake of doing them. He did them so people could learn about him and about your kingdom and about how to have eternal salvation and how to follow him. And so, Father, we pray that you would help us uh, to keep learning now. We've heard your word read. Help us as your word is preached to us now that we might keep absorbing your word so that we might more and more live in the image of Jesus, your perfect son. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I was talking to a non-church person and they said that you Christians, you're all hypocrites. You don't fully live up to what you preach. And I said, you know what? You're right. But then... So are you, so why don't you come and join us? Right, I've just got new glasses and it's a bit weird. Okay. For that person, it actually got them thinking. It was actually helpful for me to be a bit blunt with them. And here in Mark chapter 2, multiple times, Jesus is deliberately controversial and provocative. But he does that in order to bring salvation to people. He's provocative to save. And there's so much that you and I can learn from this about how we live. So let's dig into Mark 2. And of course, Jesus starts with a well-known true story. See, chapter 1 ended with Jesus being so popular, he couldn't even at that time go into a town because he would just be mobbed by people. Well... Maybe things had died down a little bit. A little bit later, he returns to his new home base, Simon Peter's house in Capernaum. But word gets out that he's back, and so a huge crowd fills up Simon's house and even fills up outside the door. And Jesus preaches the gospel to this crowd. This is verses 1 and 2. But while he's preaching, five men arrived. One man on a stretcher and his four faith-filled friends. But of course, there's so many people, they can't get the stretcher to Jesus. But being determined and loving friends that they are, they sort of, they drag the straight man on the stretcher up the outside stairs of the house and to the flat roof, and they start digging through the ceiling. This amazing boldness and determination clearly comes from being totally convinced that Jesus can and will heal their friend. Now imagine you were there, in the house, you're listening to Jesus teach about God's kingdom. He's sort of talking when dust starts falling from the ceiling. Jesus keeps speaking and then chunks of dirt and dried mud start falling and people are sort of having to dodge them. Now, nobody's listening to Jesus, everybody's looking at the ceiling, which suddenly you can see daylight and then this hole gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And then this man on a stretcher is lowered down by ropes. People have to sort of scramble out of the way. He's lowered down right in front of Jesus. And everyone can see these man's legs are, this man's legs are withered from non-use. He clearly cannot walk. So it's obvious what he and his friends want. So it's obvious what Jesus is going to do and say next, right? Wrong. He's both surprising and controversial. Verse 5. When Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralysed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. What? I mean, I wonder how disappointed the man and his friends were feeling in that moment. I mean, he's probably thinking, I came to be healed. What are you talking about? I wonder how many people in the crowd are confused right now. Or maybe thinking that Jesus clearly should have gone to spec savers. <laughs> Isn't it obvious what he needs? Well, the obvious need is not always the deepest needs. 
Because, I mean, there's possibly not a single person there who thinks Jesus has done or said the right thing. Maybe even his disciples are thinking, what? It's very surprising, but also controversial. Because every person there knows only God can forgive sins. Jesus' words seem to be claiming for himself a divine right and prerogative. It seems he's guilty of blasphemy and so should be taken out and stoned to death. Verse 6. Now some teachers of the law were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow think like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Literally, who can forgive sins except one? God. Who indeed... See, of course, Jesus could have just healed the man and it would have been one of just many healings that he performed. But he deliberately wants to show and prove that he, in and of himself, has the divine right to forgive sins, to do what only God can do, and so to indirectly show that he is divine. So, you'll now show what requires physical evidence to prove, that is, physical healing to give evidence that he can also do what cannot physically be seen, but which is a much greater work, give forgiveness. It's amazing. If you've got your Bibles there, read with me from verse 8. Immediately Jesus knew in his spirit that this was what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralysed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. He got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we've never seen anything like this. Of course they haven't. No one ever has. Anyone can just say, your sins are forgiven. But to say, get up and walk, well, you've got to prove it. In that sense, it's harder to prove. Jesus does the harder and proves that he has all the right and power and prerogative of, of God upon this earth to give forgiveness of every one of that now ex-paralysed man's sins. No one had ever seen anything like that because Jesus is the Son of Man. That's what he calls himself for the first time here in Mark's Gospel in verse 10 and was actually his favourite title for himself. It's the most common way he referred to himself. And you might know it's a title from Daniel chapter 7 in the Old Testament where it describes one who is given all authority, glory and power and thus the authority to forgive sins. You see, in God's presence, even angels bow and worship, but not the Son of Man. The people there in Simon Peter's house at ancient Capernaum, they just don't realise who is standing in front of them. This is who Jesus is. This is what the prophet Daniel saw hundreds of years before this second person of the Trinity took on flesh. Should be up on the screen. In my vision at night I looked and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. See, there in that house in ancient Capernaum, Jesus is showing you that God's kingdom comes in him, that God's kingdom is about him, the king, the one who will rule forever, the one whose rule is breaking into that world, into, in this world in an amazing way, there in that house. Jesus deliberately forgives that paralysed man's sin so that you also can say, there is no one else like Jesus, the Son of Man, the Son of God. And so firstly, just let me make sure, are your sins forgiven by Jesus? 
Because if not, they can be. Secondly, do you think of Jesus as having full divinity? And so, are you worshipping him now? But then, do you also want him to extend forgiveness to many others, including many unimpressive people like a cripple or maybe that annoying neighbour you've got or maybe the black sheep of the family? Because Jesus does. Well, that naturally just needs, leads into the, this next section in Mark 2. Capernaum was next to the Lake of Galilee and there's much more room next to the lake than there was into one very crowded house. So Jesus, who's focused on preaching the kingdom and the gospel, he again teaches a large crowd, verse 13. But then he again here is both surprising and controversial. Whereas the first time uh, he was beside the lake, he called four fishermen to be his disciples and grow his kingdom. I mean, fishermen? Hmm. Not exactly the cream of the crop of Israelite society. Not very formally educated. Probably a bit rough and ready. Like, say, why didn't he go to, say, the University of Jerusalem? and choose some smart, respectable, highly able postgraduate students as his first disciples. No, fishermen. And now, a tax collector. A hated, probably greedy and corrupt man who collected taxes from his fellow Israelites that could have ended up in the coffers of the hated Roman occupiers. Wow, what a wonderful man, hey? A man regarded as a traitor to his nation and to his God and regarded as being ritually unclean. A man probably shunned and looked down upon by many. The sort of man that no self-respecting rabbi or Pharisee would ever want to be his disciple. See, back then, our potential students would apply to the rabbi to become their student. The rabbi would just sort of wait. His reputation would bring potential students to him but no no Jesus he does the opposite he proactively go out and recruits who he wants verse 14 as Jesus walked along he saw Levi son of Alphaeus otherwise known as Matthew sitting at the tax collector's booth follow me Jesus told him and Levi got up and followed him while Jesus was having dinner at Levi's house, many tax collectors and sinners were eating with him and his disciples, for there were many who followed him. When the teachers of the law who were Pharisees saw him eating with the sinners and tax collectors, they asked his disciples, why does he eat with tax collectors and sinners? See, the sinners here are the, the non-religious Jews, those who don't follow the law of Moses, those who don't go to the temple, those who'd never be here on a Sunday. In a sense, you might say, they're your stereotypical and common Aussie. Drink, swears, and virtually never goes to church, except for maybe a funeral occasionally. See, the Pharisees were focused on obeying God's law. Well, they thought they were. And they want all Israel to obey the Torah and their interpretation of it. Because they thought that if, if everyone in Israel obeyed all of the law for just one day the Messiah would come and so when they see this new rabbi deliberately being unclean by mixing with sinners they think Jesus is hindering God's work so they're disgusted with him I mean Galilee was already known as a a hard place for the Pharisees they weren't having much success there And Jesus, they think, is just making it worse. The Pharisees don't realise that the Messiah won't come if all Israel obeys because the Messiah has already come because Israel does not obey and won't obey and can't obey. Their history should tell the Pharisees that. Just like you and I did not obey and would not obey and could not obey. We need a rescuer for morally and spiritually sick people. Not someone who congratulates us on our own prideful self-righteousness. Verse 17, on hearing this, Jesus said to the Pharisees, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. 
I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Did your own righteousness make God happy with you? Did he accept you based on your performance? If you think that, you'll never be accepted by God. Or did you come to God with deep, deep humility and confession and repentance? Did you seek, come seeking congratulations or come seeking grace? So God wants TGS to be full of people who are ex-self-righteous people, ex-spiritually self-sufficient, but now humble and thankful for God's undeserved kindness in his Son. Sometimes it's said that Christians are recovering Pharisees. We are prone to self-righteousness and pride. Oh, I'm better than her. She's not here, is she? I'm here worshipping God. Awful. Awful. But Jesus also wants you and me to be people who might be accused of eating with tax collectors and sinners. The Pharisees said that about Jesus as an accusation. He wears it as a badge of honour. It's like, well, it's like the central symbol of Christianity, the cross. Roman society was a symbol of shame and humiliation and Rome saying, you are nothing. You are a bug that we crush underneath our sandal. It was violent and stark and brutal and deliberately so. You've probably heard the name Spartacus. You might have seen a movie about him. He was a slave who led a revolt against Rome. Successful for a while, but eventually his uprising was crushed. And the Romans crucified about 6,000 men. The crosses lined a road south for about 190 kilometres. And yet, by one cross at Calvary, by that one death for sins, you and I are eternally reconciled to God. So we can gladly, even proudly, have the cross as our symbol. Wear one around your neck. And, also, and so be friends with tax collectors and sinners. Because often they're the ones who are not self-sufficient, who realise they're not impressive to God and not impressed with themselves, but are more likely to be honest with God, accept that they have need of things they need to be forgiven of. And so, friends... When did you last spend some time with people who aren't respectable, middle-class people like us? How do you feel about spending time with tax collectors and sinners? Do you ever spend time with people who aren't like you? All right, let's keep going, because Jesus has more surprising and controversial things to say to us here in Mark 2. In his day, most Jews fasted twice a week. The Pharisees did, John the Baptist's disciples did, so presumably John himself also fasted twice a week. But Jesus smashes that mould because he says, now that Messiah has come, in a sense, it's time for feasting, not fasting. See, look with me in your Bibles from verse 18, verse 18. Now John's disciples and the Pharisees were fasting. Some people came, to, came and asked Jesus, how is it that John's disciples and the disciples of the Pharisees are fasting, but yours are not? Jesus answered, how can the guests of the bridegroom fast while he is with them? They cannot, so long as they have the, him with them. But the time will come when the bridegroom will be taken away, and on that day they will fast. Jesus could have probably given numerous reasons why his disciples didn't fast. But he chooses to give this surprising answer. He claims to be the bridegroom, that is, the spiritual husband of Israel. You remember the first Bible reading today? Gail read for us, Isaiah chapter 62. Because God promised his people that he would do this. As a young man marries a young woman, so will your builder marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over her bride, so will your God. Rejoice over you. And also in Isaiah chapter 54 verse 5 or Hosea chapter 2 verses 16 to 20, it also talks about God being the husband of his people. 
So when Jesus implies here in Mark 2 that he is the bridegroom, he is saying that he is the one who brings joy and peace and security. He's not only saying that it's completely fine for his disciples to not fast then, but in a, in, in a, he's again claiming to be God. That he is the fulfilment of Israel's hopes and dreams. Again he is saying, the kingdom is about me. And he has come. And his spirit is still with us. So you and I should rejoice. Yeah, sure, there can still be a place for voluntary fasting, but that's a separate story. And so I think of the uh, the wedding I conducted uh, two Saturdays ago, Jake and Emily's. Sorry, that's the only photo I actually took. (laughs) I guess it keeps their privacy, doesn't it? They can't see their face. (laughs) But it was such a joyful time. Time of feasting. Great food, great drink. And there were lots of non-church family and friends there. And for many non-church people, me, a Christian pastor, is someone they virtually never meet. I'm a bit like a sort of a curiosity thing to a lot of people. Seriously, sort of strange but intriguing. I see the looks people give me at weddings and funerals or baptisms if there's non-Christian family who come. Well, like at many wedding receptions, the drinks were flowing. Now, I don't actually like alcohol much, so I drink very little. But when I'm at an event with non-church people, I usually do have a drink because I know it sort of humanises me a little bit in some people's eyes. It sort of like breaks the ice a bit so that I can get to know them easier and hopefully talk about Jesus, the best husband, the best person to meet at a wedding because that's far more important than alcohol or even the food. Because Jesus brings joy. There's no fasting in his presence in heaven now. We won't be fasting when he comes back in power and glory. And not only did Jesus' coming mean no fasting then and there, but it fundamentally changed lots of things. The age of the Messiah is the new age the era of the new wineskins. The new thing requires new ways, not just sort of tacking on a few additional things to Old Testament Judaism, but fundamental changes. Or as he memorably puts it in verse 22, no one pours new wine into old wineskins, otherwise the wine will burst the skins and both the wine and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins. And so, thinking that a man can't declare that sins are forgiven needs to change. Thinking that always avoiding undesirables is needed to be holy needs to change. Thinking that Jesus only came for us respectable people needs to be ejected. Believing that human rules and traditions can be changed or ignored for the salvation of sinners is a good thing. Because Jesus has come for sinners. And finally, number three, Jesus has come for good, for the good of people. And so, when Jesus' disciples pluck some wheat when they're walking through a grain field on a Sabbath, Pharisees complain that that's work, Jesus is having none of it. But again, what he says is not what you would have predicted him to say. And again, it's very controversial. Here in chapter 2, in the start of chapter 3, he is deliberately provoking people because he wants them and he wants us to really understand who he is and what he's come to do and what it means for you and me to truly follow him. See, Jesus could have just simply replied to the Pharisees that Deuteronomy 23, 25 says this, if you enter a neighbour's grain field, you may pick kernels with your hands. You must not put a sickle to their standing grain. Jesus could have simply said, it's not work. My disciples are not doing what's against the law of Moses on the Sabbath. He could just say, your interpretation of the Torah is both wrong and stupid. 
But instead, Jesus goes in a different direction. He shows these legal eagles that the law of Moses puts need above rules. He tells them their problem is that they don't know the scriptures, that they haven't taken to heart a lesson from 1 Samuel chapter 21, human need above rules, because God's rules are designed to meet real needs, not deny them. Verse 25, Jesus answers, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abiathar the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. The law of Moses said only priests could eat that bread. But the real need of David and his friends trumped that. And they did not sin. And then Jesus reminds the Pharisees that the Sabbath was to be a benefit, not a burden to be for rest and refreshment, not an unhelpful restriction. Verse 27, Jesus says, The Sabbath was made for man, that is mankind, humanity. The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. To help, not hinder. But then Jesus makes another astounding claim. See, of course, because the Sabbath was given by God. It was a divine institution. Only God has the right to change it, to be in charge of it. Here in verse 28, Jesus says that he has the authority over the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord, even of the Sabbath. Only someone divine can claim that. The Pharisees either have God in the flesh standing in front of them, or a blasphemer they should take out and stone to death. Only a human who is also the son of man with all power and authority from the father can say what he did and not be blaspheming. You see, the Messiah has come and the old wineskins of the Pharisees' wrong interpretations about the Sabbath must be discarded because God wants genuine human needs to be met by his genuine provision, not denied by stupid interpretations that of what God has clearly said in his words. Pharisees were fools. They got so tied up in all of their so-called interpretations. I think they had 39 categories of things you can't do on the Sabbath. So it's no surprise that in chapter 3, verses 1 to 6, that Jesus is both angry and distressed at the stubbornness of some people who would deny him healing someone on the Sabbath. Verse 4, Jesus gets to the heart of the problem and says, Which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save life or to kill? I mean, the answer's obvious, right? The Sabbath was made for man for people's benefits. To say that it's a sin to heal on the Sabbath was just simply evil. And Jesus was both appalled and very upset at their hard hearts. Friends, never let rules deny compassion and love and kindness. Don't become a hard-hearted Christian because our Lord hates that. You might say for all you medical people, don't develop spiritual arteriosclerosis. There you go. Diagram means virtually nothing to me, but I'm sure some does to some of you. Hardening of the arteries in English. Hardening of your soul, hardening your heart, can kill your body and kill your soul. Many of you will have heard of the late uh, Reverend Dr. John Stott. Well, that was one of his many books, Christ the Controversialist. Because Jesus deliberately provokes you for good. Like he provokes you here in Mark chapter 2. To help others go to Jesus for forgiveness of their sins. To help the tax collectors and sinners of 2023 cans. To hear and heed Jesus' call to salvation. Jesus provokes you 
to find joy and freedom in him, feasting, not fasting, you might say, and to point your family, friends and neighbours to the one who wants to do good, to save their life. So, two weeks ago I said, following Jesus makes you a radical. Do you want to follow him? That is, do you want to do these things? Will you do them this week? Let me pray for us now that we will. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we've probably heard these true stories so many times. It can be easy for us, well, in one sense, to develop that spiritual hard-heartedness. Heavenly Father, we pray that you would keep us from that. Our Lord did not come so that we could just be spiritually comfortable all the time, think we've got it all together, that we know it all. Heavenly Father, Jesus is controversial at times. At times through his word, it's as though he, he looks at us and says, do you really want to follow me? Or do you instead want to be self-satisfied in your middle-class life in Cairns, Australia? Heavenly Father, we pray that we would be willing to dine with, to be friends with the so-called tax collectors and sinners, like your son did. Heavenly Father, may we be willing to even perhaps have people sort of tut us because of the company we keep. May our company never corrupt us, but Lord, we pray that you would help us, give us opportunities to point people to Jesus for their salvation. Your, your son came for good, to bring your blessings, to bring eternal life. Help us to not be like the Pharisees. It's so easy to be like them. Help us to continue recovering from being like that. Heavenly Father, we thank you Help us to be controversial ourselves in the right ways for our holiness and for the salvation of others. Help us to do that this week. We ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, James. <laughs>
Come what may, may I, may we rest all our days in the goodness of Jesus. Please be seated. It's time now to continue our period of worship in prayer to speak to our great God. Please join me as I pray. Jesus says, the time has come, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Heavenly Father, help each of us to indeed follow your Son, the King, knowing that in him, through faith in his sacrifice, our sins are forgiven. Lord, help us to live under his good rule. Help us to not merely listen to your words, but to do what you tell us to do and to bear fruit in our lives. Lord, may we at TGS be people who are truly devoted to the apostles' teaching, as it says in Acts chapter 2. Yes, Lord, may we understand that you have saved us. You have given us new birth through your word, your word which is truth. Help us, Lord, to be people who are devoted to the fellowship and to the breaking of bread. So may we indeed care for each other in our needs and rejoice together as well. Lord, we thank you for the evening on Friday night watching the movie at Seville. We thank you for that great time of fun and fellowship together. Lord, we continue to pray for the upcoming CWCI outreach event next Saturday. Please encourage your people to attend and please may we prayerfully consider who we may invite people who don't yet know you personally. Lord, may we be people who are devoted to prayer. Help us to pray unceasingly by the power of your spirit. May we pray for the proclamation of your holy word, for your good news. May we pray for the sustaining, for the perseverance and courage of your people. Help us to pray unceasingly for those we care about, particularly those who we know still need to come to understand their need for you. And Lord, may our prayers extend outside of ourselves and outside of our circle to our society to our government and to your world that groans in sin and rejection of you. Gracious Father, we think now of those who are in physical and emotional need. You'll pray that you will give them comfort and healing and help us to see how we can play our part in meeting those needs. Lord, we pray for Phil's father in Sydney. We pray that you would help him work out future plans for his dad and his mum. We continue to pray for Stephen and Avril and for Nev and Faye and others known to us who are in need. Yes, Lord, please be with your people here and help us to continue to trust in your unfailing love. We pray this and all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Although we are saved through faith in Jesus, it is right to continue to confess our sins to him and ask for his forgiveness. I invite you to say the prayer on the screen with me. Merciful God, our maker and judge, we have sinned against you in thought, 
word and deed and in what we have failed to do. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbours as ourselves. We repent and are sorry for all our sins. Father, forgive us. Strengthen us to love and obey you in newness of life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. There are many assurances of forgiveness in Scripture. This one from Isaiah. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they shall be like wool. And from the New Testament we understand that all of that is through our union in Christ Jesus. I invite you to say with me the Nicene Creed together. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic and Apostolic Church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Amen indeed. It's nice to sing to say the Nicene Creed. Can we haven't done that for a little while? It's wonderful. We're going to sing again. Crown him with many crowns, the Lamb upon the throne. In Re Revelation chapters 4 and 5, we hear of the 24 elders laying their crowns before the throne. And when John looked in his vision, he says, I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne. That's the image. Please stand.
Amen. Please be seated as we round up. Yes, thank you so much for being with us this morning as we praise our great God, our Creator and our Redeemer, the Son of Man. Please um, remember to put your care and communication cards up the back. Um, please, if you haven't done so already, check your details in the directory. Don't forget the CWCI afternoon tea. Forget, don't forget about Rachel and the sound and live stream operators, all of those things. It is uh, important to remember that that God has given us everything, so please, and he is the source of all our ability to create wealth. So if you wish to contribute to the worship and ministry here at TGS, please either contribute electronically, or the details are in the pew sheet, or put your gifts in the box up the back on the wall. Thank you again. As we go out, please say this t together. Father... We offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ our Lord. Send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. Thank you for being with us. Thank you on the live stream for being with us as well. And I do hope to see you over at morning tea. Thanks again.